welcome to Short Story Boudoir, where we aim to do a close reading of a single story every episode because everyone has time to read one story. My name is Samantha Neukebauer. I'm Katie Gathright. And today we'll be talking about Phil Cly's short story, Redeployment. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this one. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's the holiday time for us. Mm -hmm. So we always like to do a lot of reading this time of year. Um, but yeah, this is the first story in Phil Cly's collection by mm -hmm. the same name, Redeployment. It was a 2014 National Book Award mm -hmm. winner, also listed as one of the top 10 books of the year by mm -hmm. the New York Times. So it received a lot of attention when it came out, but I think this mm -hmm. is the first year either you or I have right. read one of his um, mm -hmm. short stories. So it's a new a new writer for us. Mm -hmm. um, but just to talk a little bit about what happens in this story, mm -hmm. it really covers the story of a first person narrator on his way home from a seven month deployment in mm -hmm. Iraq. Um, and much of the story is actually spent describing the literal journey back, mm -hmm. including the flights that he and his fellow um, people on his platoon take. And then it talks about sort of reintegration back mm -hmm. into life in the US. So he gets reunited with his wife and so do his friends with their wives or girlfriends. Mm -hmm. um, it kind of talks about that adjustment period and then it ends with him um, having to face the death of his dog and actually exactly. being the person who shoots his dog because we do have spoilers in this podcast, but that's a pretty mm -hmm. crucial um, ending point right. for the story. Mm -hmm. And it's something that's um, foreshadowed pretty heavily in the beginning of the right. story too. So it really provides kind of the spine for the story. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe we should just read the opening lines. Yeah. Just so if you haven't read the story yet, though, we encourage you to. Um, you kind of get a feel for both the voice of the narrator and how much kind of dogs really factor into the yeah. story in a way that was surprising to me. At first. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. I agree. Okay, the first lines go, we shot dogs, not by accident. We did it on purpose and we called it Operation Scooby. I'm a dog person, so I thought about that a lot. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, you know, right from the beginning, you know, mm -hmm. as we were just talking about how we're both animal lovers, you <laughs> yeah. get your hackles up mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of a story like that. But yeah, it's pretty clear about right. what kind of story it is, what kind of tone the story mm -hmm. is going to take. Um, and you're the sort of, there's a lot of truth in advertising, I think, in those first few right. lines about where Absolutely. the story goes. Right, I agree. Um, so should we get started? Yeah. Do you, have, do you want to start with a question? Or yeah, a sure. Point? So, mm -hmm. I mean, one thing I thought about a lot um, mm -hmm. with the story was that it's in second person mm -hmm. and it's sort of a, an unusual choice. A lot of stories right. aren't in right. second person and then you really feel that you, it's talking to a you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm curious what how you felt about it being right. in second person. I have some, you know, feelings about mm -hmm. it, but curious if that struck you as a noticeable thing about the story. It definitely struck me as a noticeable thing, honestly, right from the beginning, but I think I interpreted it differently in my second read than I did my first mm -hmm. read. I think in the first read, I felt that, you know, kind of the self of the narrator had sort of ballooned into, um, you know, a self that consists of him and his like platoon yeah. kind of mates. Um, but then on my second reading, I was thinking more about like, actually, is he, you know, indicting the reader, mm. you know, we're yeah. both Americans and, you know, are we, we shot dogs, yeah. right? Um, whether or not, you know, we kind of officially supported this war, we're old enough yeah. to understand yeah. its parameters. I felt like there was definitely a story or this de story was definitely asking for like self examination and have questions of complicity. Yeah. Which a lot of the stories actually we've talked about on this past on this podcast seem to be asked. Yeah, right I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. There is there is kind of a combatant relation mm -hmm. combative relationship with the reader, yeah. I think, with that you mm -hmm. and I do feel like the story wants to challenge us. Yeah. And clearly I think um you know that voice is is mm -hmm. pretty insistent, I think, throughout that this has been a really challenging experience right. and like there's sort of like an in group out group feel right. that runs throughout the the full story um but i you know i got to thinking about that you and it almost feels like you know this is a story that didn't necessarily have to talk about other characters at all mm -hmm. it really could have just stayed inside the narrator's head but you know he does mention some of the other people right. um, by name and i almost wonder if the you is almost like He's trying to like be the voice of all of them and kind of talk on their mm -hmm. behalf. There's sort of a solidarity, I think, mm -hmm. implied and almost like he's telling the story very mm -hmm. actively, knowing that maybe not everybody else 
can or wants mm -hmm. to. Um, yeah. So I felt that a little bit as well. Like almost as a, kind of a gathering of the voices. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think bit. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Um. Yeah, and I, I just think that sense of camaraderie comes through, even though they're very lightly sketched mm -hmm. secondary characters. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think that, you know, especially for a lot of American school children, you know, we grow up at some point reading Tim O'Brien's The Things yeah. They Carried, and a lot, for a lot of people, like, that's their touchstone yeah. for, yeah. like, you know, kind of war stories. Um, and I did feel a slight, like, homage to that yeah. in the Wii as well. Yeah, you know, I think um, that's a great point. Yeah, and I do think in general, while this collection, um, you know, came out in 2014, I do think it owes a lot to other war literature mm -hmm. and does mm -hmm. feel like, um, you know, it's very interested, obviously, in PTSD and right. kind of that kind of headspace you get into. Mm -hmm. And I do think it will probably remind you of other stories or novels like that yeah. um, if this is your first Phil Clay story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and actually, I think that point kind of brings us nicely to one of the questions I have. Yeah. Um, so, you know, typically I'm usually hesitant to assert that someone needs to read a full collection of stories in order to appreciate a specific story. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, this is my first Phil Cly story. It's the first one in the collection. And when I ha when I did a little bit of investigating after reading the story, it did seem that everyone was talking about the stories as a collective. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm wondering, do you feel like this is maybe one of those you know rare examples where really the sum is important rather than kind of the parts of the whole? Yeah, I think that's a good question because mm -hmm. I think while this story certainly has an arc, and we talked about the mm -hmm. you know the dog plot line running right. through it. Um, it did really feel like an like an introduction to me. Right. You know, okay. It really felt like this is a story that's establishing a certain point of view. Mm -hmm. um, and having read you know some of the other stories mm -hmm. in the collection, I think that point of view remains really important to mm -hmm. this writer. Um, and I do feel like it's interesting too being the first story, and because it's it's a collection about the war, mm -hmm. right? But most of the story takes place either already on the way back mm -hmm. from deployment or back in the US already. And so I do think there's a way in which it's interesting to start there, right? At the right. end of a deployment. <laughs> True. And mm -hmm. it really does invite you to say, okay, well, like, what are the things that led up to this character becoming like this or feeling right. this way? Um, and while it's not a linked collection, like mm -hmm. all the stories aren't, right. you know, about this one specific character, mm -hmm. but I do think it's it's like an invitation to be curious about the war. Mm -hmm. And I don't think um, this story in particular necessarily encapsulates all the particulars of mm -hmm. Iraq or of right. the war over there, right? It's more like, this is the headspace, this is like getting mm -hmm. you warmed up to then right. wanna investigate further. And right, and I think that's interesting to me, especially because, you know, I enjoyed this story, and yet at the same time, when I finished it, I thought, you know, why is this, you know, experience of the soldier particular to the Iraq War? Yeah. And, you know, on one hand, I was thinking, like, maybe that's the point, right? That, you know, the PTSD that the narrative of the story is facing feels very much like the shell shock yeah, that yeah. Septimus has in Mrs. Dalloway. Like, yeah. maybe that is the thread. But at the same time, it did feel like this story is kind of pitched as, you know, very particularly tied to this war. Yeah. And that maybe that comes across when reading the whole collection or other stories. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. And I do think if that is something, and again, we talked about right. all those awards it got, and I do mm -hmm. think that's, yeah, that is one of the right. pitches of this collection mm -hmm. as we get into those specifics um, of that war in particular. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and this story feels much more interested in the psychology um, right. mm -hmm. and the particular psychology of, of coming home, mm -hmm. which again, I think is its own thing, right? right. Um, mm -hmm. So it's almost like, yeah, starting at the end in a way, yeah. which is an interesting way to structure yeah. a collection, I think. Um, I agree. Yeah. Um, thinking about the yeah. collection, though, and how this is the title story, right. um, I'm curious about yeah, that redeployment mm -hmm. theme. Like, did that feel like a, an interesting theme to you? Um, how did you read the redeployment title? Yeah, I think that um, my understanding um, of, you know, of the Iraq War and of Afghanistan too, um, to an extent, is that, 
Um, there was so much redeployment, in fact, partially because we don't have a draft anymore yeah. in the United States. Um, but it's certainly, um, you know, as someone who is not a vet and who does not have a vet in my immediate family, yeah. you know, the idea of redeployment is is really kind of on one hand very striking to me. I mean, the kind of sacrifice that someone, yeah. you know, have to have within themselves for that. Um, and then all the same time, it's, it's sort of mystifying to mm -hmm. me, right? Um, and so I was interested to see where the story would go to, with that theme. And at one point I thought, oh, this story will end with, you know, the idea that he, you know, can't acclimate to civilian yeah. life. And so he must redeploy. But in fact, we actually don't get that in the yeah, story, yeah. right? Like he doesn't actually um, re-enlist or, you know, whatnot. Um, and in, and in fact, he redeploys sort of in a different way, like in, you know, his community by his older dog. He, instead of taking it to the vet, he decides to take it to, you know, kind of a dirt road or a yeah. field. And, you know, he gives it its final death blow. And so in a way, I think redeployment is speaking to that. Yeah. Is that yeah. how you read it? Yeah, that is how mm -hmm. I read it. I think the redeployment happens yeah. right then and there yeah. when he shoots his dog. Mm -hmm. Although as you were talking, I yeah. was thinking about how um, in some ways, you're right, it's interesting that we don't get the actual literal public redeployment yeah. of going back mm -hmm. um, to the war zone. But you can almost read the story as like, it like gives you all the breadcrumbs to know that he is going to go back. Right. right? You can mm -hmm. almost see this as sort of like, you know, maybe, yeah, logistically or politically, yeah. he's going to have to go back. And that maybe personally he would want to. Mm -hmm. There's sort of that sense, which I think comes through in other war stories as well, that um, it's almost so hard to adjust back to civilian life mm -hmm. that the only choice is to go back to the war zone. Yeah. So you can kind of read the story as he almost doesn't need to say it, that right. he's going to redeploy. Absolutely. Yeah, mm -hmm. which I think is, um, yeah, it's sort of an understated part of the story, mm -hmm. um, which I, you know, appreciate, yeah. I think. Definitely. Um, I thought um, I'd share my favorite line. Yeah, please. Sure. Okay, so um, my favorite line in the story is, And McMagnigan, of all people, was the one who cleaned him up and got him into base on time for the classes they make you take about don't kill yourself, don't beat your wife, and Weisert was like, I can't beat my wife. I don't know where the fuck she is. Um, so this line comes at a point where um, our narrator and um, some of his fellow soldiers are back in the States. Yeah. And um, his one, the one other soldier who is a close friend goes home to find that his house has been cleared out. His wife has not waited for him. She is gone. And they're sort of taking care of him as best they can. What I found interesting about this line was, you know, sort of the flippant energy of the yeah. courses um, yeah. that they're required to take. You know, these alternate titles, don't kill yourself and don't beat your wife. Um, both because on one hand, they sound like exactly the type of classes that when we talk about what vets might need and what services mm -hmm. we want to give them might make sense. But on the other hand, when kind of phrased like that, you realize both like, you know, how maybe insufficient they are for what yeah. they need. But if that's not what they need, what do they need? Absolutely. Right? And I do feel like that's one of the, it was one of those moments in the story where I found myself being like, oh, wow, I really want to know way more about these right. classes and exactly. I want to know like the experience of sitting through a class mm -hmm. and I want to I want to like not breeze past this moment right. but like really dive mm -hmm. in and I think this the story isn't isn't here to really give us that and right. I think um again it sort of feels like the story almost knows you're gonna really mm -hmm. be curious about right. that but doesn't want to give it to you um and so I think that's interesting too but it mm -hmm. really was that glimpse of like integration right. that I was most curious about in this story. Absolutely, and I think that I was interested in all the logistical parts, mm -hmm. right? So we learned that kind of they're flown to Kuwait first and yeah. they sort of have a decompression time. And, you know, we get a little bit of insight into that. And then like, this is a little bit of insight into kind of the integration time on the US side. Yeah. And that is what I wanted. I yeah. wanted to know about this. Um, and I found myself, you know, at times being, you know, less, interested in um kind of his personal struggle than i was in kind of 
the systematic or the systems of war yeah. and you know that made me question myself as a reader you know why am I more interested in these parts and it felt very intentional yeah mm -hmm. it does feel intentional and again maybe that's where some of that tone comes right. from you know like mm -hmm. the speaking to you it's almost right. like I felt like he could read our minds a little bit <laughs> what he knew we might want and right. sort of denying that to mm -hmm. us a little bit. Um, Definitely. But yeah, my um, favorite line also had to do with a wife. Okay. Um, <laughs> so I'll share it. So there's this scene where all the soldiers are coming back mm -hmm. and like they're, and they're reuniting with their families and all the family members have various signs mm -hmm. to welcome the soldiers mm -hmm. back. And so with our narrator, um, he is like scanning the crowd, I think, to see mm -hmm. where his wife Cheryl is, mm -hmm. and then he sees her and the sign that she's holding up. And so my favorite line is actually the language that she puts on her <laughs> sign, um, which is, Sergeant Price, now that you're home, you can do some chores. Here's your to-do list. One, me. Two, repeat number one. Um, and so, yeah, it's this nice, like, saucy little moment right. in the story. Um, so I like it for that mm -hmm. reason alone. But I think I was just really interested in this as a moment of surprise in mm -hmm. the story. So, again, and we've talked about some of the ways in which this feels like a, um, you know, somewhat conventional um, story of post-war time psychology. Mm -hmm. But I do think, you know, along with that, there have been some hints along the way that he's feeling a little bit of distance from his right. wife. I think they had kind of a logistical somewhat distant mm -hmm. phone call about his timing for coming home mm -hmm. and we don't get the sense that like their marriage is like the most solid it's ever been mm -hmm. and that feels very you know maybe expected in the context of this yeah. story so I was sort of expecting a you know a melancholy reunion or for mm -hmm. her to be um for her to be really distant when she right. saw him or something that felt very like signposty about mm -hmm. um, how the war has affected their relationship. Mm -hmm. And so I really appreciated the choice for this sign to be mm -hmm. something, um, you know, really lighthearted and something mm -hmm. saying like, oh no, like actually here's her wife and she wants to have right. sex with her husband <laughs> after this long estrangement. So I thought that worked really well for me. Yeah, it definitely worked well for me too. And the surprise yeah. itself was just really nice. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it also did feel to me that, you know, she was ready, you know, not just for sex with him, but to have any conversation he wanted, right? Yeah. And so I, I felt like what ultimately was so interesting to me about this story was he didn't, the, the narrator didn't seem to know what to ask for, like mm -hmm. didn't know what question to ask of kind of society of his wife. And... At the same time, society and his wife didn't know what to ask him either. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. Yeah, And, you know, I, I often feel like, you know, some people like will think like, well, what, what they need is, you know, they need counseling or they need to go to these classes. Yeah. And he like dismissed them, you know, at the turn of a hand, you know, or a phrase, I should say. Um, and so, yeah, I think that the story will linger with me for a while. Um, thinking about how sometimes maybe we just don't know the questions to ask each other. Yeah, that's a really mm -hmm. nice way to put it. Um, yeah, I do feel like this is a narrator who is who is smart mm -hmm. and who actually has a lot of really, an ability to process his emotions as they're happening. He has several really interesting ways of describing his headspace, right. like the mm -hmm. code orange piece yeah. in the middle. Um, but you're right, that doesn't really necessarily translate into knowing how to get the right kind of support or knowing, yeah, yeah what question to ask. Yeah, yeah. Great. Well, um, we hope you enjoyed this brief discussion of this story, and we encourage you all to read it. Yeah, read it, uh, the story, read the whole collection, mm -hmm. see how you, well, our official thing right. is to read one story, right. but if you yeah. have some extra time yeah. this holiday season. We might season, take an ex ex exception for this one. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Um, but yeah, it was nice talking about yeah. it with you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.